Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Mouse and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is actually going to be the finale in my Summer of True Crime series. So far as of today, of this filming this, there has been 42 different cases covered in this Summer of True Crime series with over 16 different true crime creators from across the planet taking part. It has been absolutely phenomenal and I can't thank everyone enough for supporting this series and for helping us get these lesser known cases out there. Today's video, as you can probably tell from the thumbnail and probably also the title, is featuring the absolutely outstanding Danielle Hallen. I'm so excited to work with her on the cases that we have for this series. There is two videos that we've done together, the one on my channel here and the one over on Danielle's channel, which you can check out at the end of this video when you finish watching this one. If you don't know who Danielle Hallen is, she is a really, really talented and very thorough true crime YouTuber who covers a whole wide range of cases. So be sure to go check out her channel when you finish watching this video. Like I said, this is the finale of the Summer of True Crime series and it's been such a really big learning experience and a really good opportunity to get the lesser known cases out there. And I, like I said, I, I, I just can't thank everyone enough for their support in this series. It has been so heartwarming. When this video goes live, it would have been my 21st birthday yesterday on the 13th of July. So I'm gonna be 21 when this video is up. So uh, thank you everyone already for your happy birthday wishes that you've been sending me throughout the week. It is so heartwarming to me to see those wishes. Before we go any further, I just want to say that you can request a case for me to cover on this channel and request a case for other true crime creators to cover on their channels by going to requestacase.com um, and you can submit all your case information there. I'd just like to point out this video has not been made to cause disrespect or anything like that. It's just been made to spread awareness about this case by compiling information from various different public sources on the internet. I have left a more in-depth disclaimer in the description and with all that being said, let's delve right into this case. For Bob Yunt, Monday the 13th of June 1987 started out just as normally as every Monday that had come before it. Now Bob was a truck driver who was making his usual deliveries to the bustling city of Anchorage, Alaska. Anchorage at the time had grown rapidly from only having about 48,000 residents to over 170,000 residents between 1970 and 1980. Now this population boom as you can imagine, provided a lot of work for a lot of different sectors in Anchorage, and especially the truck drivers. And Bob found himself making frequent routine deliveries to and from the city. And Bob would usually carry out these deliveries without incident. However, on this particular Monday, Bob would witness an event that would be a catalyst for law enforcement in the Anchorage area to tracking down and arresting a man that hunted girls for fun in the Alaskan wilderness. This is the curious case of the Alaskan human hunter. On the 13th of June in 1987, Bob was driving his truck down 6th Avenue 1st in Anchorage, Alaska when a disheveled young woman ran out into the middle of the road. This young woman was completely barefoot and she had her hands bound together with rope. Bob was quick to stop and let this young woman into his truck and found out that she was 17-year-old Cindy Paulson. Cindy asked Bob if she could be driven to the nearest hotel so that she could use her phone in order to call authorities. 
Bob happily obliged and drove her to the Mush Inn, which was the closest place that he could get to, and Cindy immediately leapt out of the car and ran straight into the inn. Bob was very confused about what he had just witnessed and continued driving to the depot in Anchorage where he then called authorities himself to let them know about what had just happened. When police got to Mush End to investigate Bob's report, the receptionist informed them that the strange girl had actually already left in a taxi to go to a nearby motel called the Big Timber Motel. When police arrived, they opened the door to room 110 and they found 17-year-old Cindy Paulson sitting on the bed, still handcuffed and completely alone. Law enforcement immediately took her to a local police station to question her about the reports that they had received. Cindy told the police that a man had offered her in the region of $200 to conduct all on him. However, when she had gotten into this man's car, he had actually pulled a firearm on her. The man then took Cindy to his house where he tormented her and then assaulted her sexually. According to Cindy, the man then tied and chained Cindy up in the basement before he went and took a nap on the sofa upstairs. When the man woke up, he forced her into the back of his car before driving to Merrill Field Airport. And it was when they got to the airport that the man told her that he was going to take her to his cabin. Now, while the man was getting the light aircraft ready for takeoff, loading it with bits of luggage and doing some checks, Cindy was crouched in the footwell of the back seat. She actually had her hands tied in front of her which made it pretty easy for her to crawl and she did that she crawled out of the back seat opened the driver's side door and ran for her life and she ran as fast as she could towards 6th Avenue first and Cindy has strategically done this by doing it when the man's back was turned now upon hearing this the police immediately went to the Merrill Field Airport to check the flight logs to see who had been using that airport that day and to try to determine who had allegedly kidnapped Cindy and when they did did that, they discovered that a man called Robert Hansen had actually prepared his aircraft for takeoff earlier on that day, but for unknown reasons, he had aborted this takeoff. And Robert Hansen also matched Indy's description of the man that had kidnapped her. However, the police officers didn't immediately arrest Robert Hansen. When they invited him in for questioning, Robert told the authorities that Cindy was simply a lying sex worker that was trying to extort money from him, and unfortunately, the authorities ended up believing this. This was mainly due to the fact that Robert Hansen was a very successful local business owner in Anchorage. He owned and ran a local bakery and on top of this he was known to be a really big family man. He was married and he had two children and this ended up giving a lot more weight and credibility to his story over a 17 year old girl who performed intimate acts for money. Robert was also able to provide police with a concrete alibi backed by his good friend John Henning. That alibi, along with his reputation as a good man, completely cleared his name as a suspect and he was permitted to leave and authorities were back to square one. One of the investigating officers of the Alaska State Troopers called Detective Glenn Floth, I think, or Floth, decided that something didn't quite sit right about Robert Hansen's story and there was something about Cindy's story that really compelled him to do a quick search of the area that Robert himself had a cabin. Over the next few months, law enforcement discovered the remains of several women in the Matanuska Susitna Valley area. And the investigators were quick to link these discoveries to other discoveries that had been made in the Anchorage and Seward areas. On the 21st of July 1980, the skeletal remains of a woman was actually found by construction workers near Eklunta Road. Due to the location of the discovery, the unknown body was named Eklunta Annie by the investigators. The remains had actually been buried in a shallow grave and the medical examiners upon conducting a post-mortem determined that she had actually actually passed away just the year prior in 1979, either in winter or late fall. The medical examiners also suggested that the woman had succumbed to knife-related injuries, however they couldn't say that for certain due to the state of decomposition that the remains were in. The Eklunta antibody has never been identified. A YouTube channel called Daughter Remus actually covered the Eklunta Annie Jane Doe file in great detail, so I'll make sure to 
to leave a link to that video in the description down below so that you can go get more information about that case and so that you can conduct your own further research. Later that same year, in 1980, the body of a woman was found in a gravel pit in Seaward. And this body was actually identified to be the body of missing girl Joanna Messina. Then in 1982, the remains of a 23-year-old woman called Sherry Moreau were also discovered. And they were found in a shallow grave near the Nick River. It was becoming quickly clear to the investigators that they had some kind of human hunter on their hands. The detectives decided to bring in the FBI to try and put together a character profile of the perpetrator. The FBI used the injuries that were sustained by the victims to put together this profile. The profile suggested that whoever this hunter was, they were very experienced at hunting. Further to this, they likely had low self-esteem and was often rejected by women, or they had a history of being rejected by women. Interesting to note, the profile also suggested that the perpetrator had a stutter. Now, I'm not quite sure how the FBI and what techniques they use to be able to determine that, but I just found that really interesting that they were, be able to, that they were able to say that the perpetrator had a stutter. The profile went on to say that the perpetrator would likely have felt compelled to keep souvenirs of his victims. And these souvenirs could have ranged from jewelry to clothing, you know, that kind of thing. Now, as you can imagine, Robert Hansen fit this criminal profile to the T. Not only did he fit this criminal profile that the FBI had created, Created, he also owned a small aircraft and he had a cabin in the area where these bodies were being found. Now using Candy's testimony and this criminal profile match, the detectives applied and quickly obtained a search warrant. And this warrant was to search Robert's house, his car, his plane and his remote cabin. And it wasn't long before the investigators would discover evidence that would horrify and shock them beyond doubt. On the 27th of October in 1983 in Anchorage, the investigators that had been combing through Robert's house ended up discovering a collection of jewelry in the attic. This collection of jewelry was sent in for identification and it was quickly confirmed to be the jewelry of the missing women. Also in the attic, the investigators discovered several firearms which matched the gun profiles on some of the victims' bodies. Robert Hansen was immediately arrested and questioned by the authorities. The detective the detectives presented the evidence that they had found within Robert's home to Robert himself and initially he denied knowing anything about these items, where they came from or that they were even his. But then Robert's story began to change. He began to tell the officers that it was the woman's fault and he tried to justify to them why he brutally butchered these women like animals. So he had completely shifted his story from knowing nothing to justifying his actions. Then and the full truth finally came out when investigators ended up finding a map that was covered in X marks behind the headboard of his bed. Each X on the map indicated a woman's grave. Robert was very quick to agree to a plea bargain with the authorities and as a part of that agreement he finally began to fully cooperate with the authorities. He took responsibility for 17 different victims, however a lot of the estimates actually indicate that the numbers were much much higher than that. Strangely though, Robert refused to tell authorities the location of all of his victims' graves. He only identified 12 out of the 17 he admitted to, which means that five of the victims' burial sites have not been located still to this day. Robert had managed to completely avoid detection for over a decade, which was largely down to the fact that he was so unsuspected by the entire community. He was seen as this well-liked, charismatic man who just ran the local bakery. He was just an average guy. He had two children. He was always friendly. But what the community didn't see was that deep down, Robert Hansen was a cold and calculated human being. Robert Christian Hansen was born in Esteville in Iowa on Wednesday the 15th of February 1939. His father was actually a Danish immigrant who owned a bakery in Esteville. Now Robert would actually grow up and take on the family business and follow in his father's footsteps. When Robert was a teenager, he was a skinny, skimpy boy who had severe acne, a stutter, and was extremely shy. 
He was constantly rejected and turned away by the girls at his school, which actually led him, growing up, to hate them. He would fantasize and dream about the ways he could get revenge on the girls at his school. Now, throughout Robert's childhood and his teenage years, he was described by those who knew him as quiet and as a loner. Robert actually had a dysfunctional relationship with his father due to the fact that his father would be very dominant and almost dictator-like. Now, as a coping mechanism, Robert learned how to hunt as a young teenager. He would take out all his anger and frustrations on the animals of the forests. In 1957, Robert Hansen enlisted in the United States Army Reserve, and it was only in the Army Reserve for one year before he was discharged for reasons unknown. Robert then went on to work as an assistant drill instructor at a police academy in Pocahontas, Iowa. It was while he was at this academy that Robert met and fell in love with a woman, and they actually got married in 1960. However, on the 7th of December 1960, Robert was arrested on arson charge for burning down a school bus garage. He was promptly charged and sentenced to three years in prison on these charges, however he only served about 20 months, which is just under two years. Robert's wife filed for divorce while Robert was serving his sentence. Once he was released, Robert was actually jailed several more times, but that was mainly just due to uh, smaller charges such as petty theft. In 1963, Robert then married his second wife and had two children with her before moving the young family to Anchorage, Alaska for a fresh start. The local community in Anchorage welcomed the family with open arms, with Robert routinely setting brand new hunting records. However, his good impression in Anchorage didn't last for very long when he was arrested and convicted in 1972 of assault. And then in 1976, he ended up pleading guilty to larceny after he stole a chainsaw from a local department store. For the crime, he was sentenced five years in prison, and he was also required to receive psychiatric treatment for his bipolar disorder, but for some reason, the Supreme Court actually ended up reducing his sentence, and he was released in 1978 after only serving two years. If Robert had served the full five years he had initially been given, a lot of his victims would likely still be alive today. Robert's victims were typically young women and were usually between the age of 16 and 19, and his earlier victims actually weren't sex workers or strippers. When he began his human hunting spree, he would target any woman that he basically found attractive. However, it wasn't long before he kind of put two and two together and realized that sex workers and strippers were much easier targets. Due to Anchorage's sudden explosion throughout the 1970s and the 1980s, a lot of construction construction went underway, and this brought in a lot of migrant workers and opportunistic sex workers. The sudden disappearance of a sex worker wasn't something to be alarmed about, primarily due to the transient way that these sex workers lived, and Robert knew that his victims probably wouldn't be missed. He would kidnap the women and take them to his remote cabin in the Matanuska Susitna Valley area. Apologies if I'm pronouncing that wrong. And when they got there, he would actually set them free. And he would let them believe that they had some chance of and some hope of surviving and escaping. However, as the women ran for their lives through the forest of the Matsu Valley area, Robert would track them down. He would take his time. This was his game. The thrill of the hunt. He would take his hunting knife and a Ruger Mini-14 semi-automatic rifle and stalk them as if they were prey. He would play mind games on them, torturing them for seemingly hours. He would let his game go on for days at a time before he would locate his prey and shoot them as if they were game. Robert Hansen was initially charged with assault, kidnapping, multiple weapon offense charges, theft, and insurance fraud. The insurance fraud charge was actually due to the fact that he had filed a claim against his insurance company over the alleged theft of some trophies. He would then use the money from this insurance claim to move to Anchorage from Iowa, and he would further use this money to then buy the bakery in Anchorage. 
after ballistics tests were carried out on Robert's firearms, it was determined that his principal weapon of choice was his rifle, and he used that rifle in all of his crimes. Robert Hansen was charged with four counts of homicide, and as part of his plea deal, he received a sentence in the federal prison, and he would not receive any publicity in the press. Now, during his trial, he told the court of how he would track down his victims, and even on some occasions, if his victims could convince him that they wouldn't go to the police, he actually let them go. 12 of the 17 confirmed victims were exhumed by the police, with their remains being safely returned to their families for burial and for funerals. And if their families could not be located, they were given a state funeral. Robert Hansen was found guilty on all charges and was sentenced to 461 years in prison, plus a further life in prison charge without the possibility of parole. Robert Hansen then passed away in prison at the age of 75 on the 20th of August 2014, taking the location and identities of five of his victims' burial sites to the grave. And that is everything that we have for you in today's case. Thank you so much for watching this finale in my Summer of True Crime series. If you're new here, I usually upload one or more true crime videos a week. I've left links in my description to go check out my entire true crime playlist and the Summer of True Crime playlist so you can catch up on all those cases. Thank you so much for Daniel Hallen for coming over and working with me on this case and helping me cover it for you. Don't forget to jump over to her channel and check out the case we did over there. It was very, very interesting and the case was very, very sad too. Don't forget to like this video if you found it interesting, leave a comment down below telling me what you thought of this case, subscribe and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time that I post. I'm actually going on holiday as of tomorrow from when this video is posted for two weeks in LA, so I will be posting two videos, one video a week in that two weeks, so you won't be missing out on any content. So I just thought I'd let you know that I am going to be on holiday for two weeks and then when I get back, I'm gonna be going full throttle with some massive cases for you that I have lined up. Don't forget that you can send case requests to requestacase.com and with all that being said I will see you in the next video. In the beginning I just didn't know That you're an enemy I held too close Now I know Cause you did everything to prove me wrong You were not the guy I thought now I'm beating you at your own, yeah If I got a dollar for every time you slam the door I would be the richest girl